This is Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. And now your host, Michael O'Fallon. It is one of my earliest memories. It was in late 1969, when I wasn't even two years old, that I remember. I remember a crisp morning with the smell of cinnamon mixed with popcorn. I remember voices filled with happiness, anticipation, and joyful expectation. I remember my parents, who were normally in strife, but they were happy. I remember my brother and I, though I was not yet an age that I could speak, pointing to things and enjoying all that was happening around us. I remember the submarines. I remember the sound of people singing in harmony, joyful fun tunes, and I remember that I was somewhere where just about everything seemed right. That was the day when my parents took my brother and I to Disneyland in Anaheim, California. And through the next several years, my mother would introduce me to the films of Walt Disney, the really rich and glorious cinema that Disney made back in those days. I remember the first time that I saw Pinocchio and marveled at the story. Alice in Wonderland and Peter Pan really got my imagination running as a young child. But it was Fantasia. Fantasia was both the most beautiful arrangement of classical music and as well imagery. And the most frightening sound and imagery that anyone could ever conjure up in the impressionable mind of a young child that was contained within the night on Bald Mountain, the massive demonic presence bringing the dead souls into his manipulation. But then there was light. As Disney transitioned from the ghoulishly demonic into the light of the good, and holy, that would vanquish the darkness. This was the Walt Disney that I knew. It was the Walt Disney that was a force for good, willing to look into the eyes of the dragon of chaos, evil and mayhem, and bring forth the cause of the good, of the beautiful, of the lovely, of the kind. The sort of kindness that is found in a loving father and a loving mother. The sort of kindness, warmth, and security that is found in a civilization that is sure and confident in its moral moorings at a Judeo-Christian and objectively oriented dock. And then, in 1972, several years later, When we moved back to South Florida, my parents took my brother and I to the new world of Disney, Walt Disney World, in Central Florida. We drove past the multitudes of orange groves, stayed overnight in a motel in Kissimmee, and then boarded the paddle-wheeled steamer to take us to the Magic Kingdom. And now... With fully enhanced cognitive understanding, I absorbed and enjoyed all the smells of popcorn, cotton candy, and freshly baked pretzels, along with the abundant fresh flowers, immaculately trimmed and in place. And the flowers' fragrance followed us everywhere. And the sounds of Main Street, USA, enveloped us as we walked the street, heading towards Adventureland, past the Crystal Palace in the shadow of Cinderella's castle and into shifting sounds of adventure and tropical cultures of Adventureland. 
into the 19th century pioneer spirit of Frontierland, the 18th century courage of Liberty Square, which gave me a sense as a young boy, a sense of pride and history, of being an American, and into the fantasy cartoon book of Fantasyland, where we could understand that it is a small world, after all. And then finally, into a look, into a look of progress in the future of Tomorrowland. All along the way, experiencing the immersive rides and shows perfectly designed along the way. The Magic Kingdom of Walt Disney World gave a young boy a sense of what wonderful traditions we should embrace as an American. It gave the same young boy a sense of adventure and the value in taking a risk, going beyond comfort. And it gave a sense of imagination and otherworldliness, and not to mention a sure, focused purpose to not just preserve and value our cherished past, but to look forward to measured and smart progress in the future. We could see this in the Wheel of Progress in Tomorrowland, where Disney valued the family dynamic no matter what age of technological and scientific progress we would live in. And Walt Disney believed this because he absolutely did not want communism to be in any future of mankind. Each year, as I grew year by year, I became rather fascinated with the story of Walt Disney. Not to mention his nearly flawlessly conceived imaginative theme parks. And as we returned to the Magic Kingdom over the years, I would memorize every inch of the theme park. I would memorize the nearly identical tracks of both sides of Space Mountain's Beta and Alpha tracks. I would be able to tell the history of design, build, and construction of each of the rides. And I would as well tell the story of Walter Elias Disney and his dream. And that the Magic Kingdom was not his ultimate dream. His dream was, well, let me tell Walt's story first. On December 5th, 1901, Walter Elias Disney was born in a small neighborhood in Chicago. He was one of five children of Irish, Canadian, German, and American descent. When Walt was four years old, his family moved to Missouri, where his artistic talent was sparked by a neighborhood doctor who asked him to draw his horse. Young Walt instantly fell in love with art and intently developed his skills by copying the cartoons in his father's newspaper. At seven years old, Walt decided to help his struggling family by selling his drawings to neighbors and family friends. More or less like yours truly, at school, Walt was rather inattentive. His teachers would often catch him daydreaming or doodling pictures of animals and nature. As he grew older, he picked up a knack for storytelling and would tell his classmates outlandish tales while illustrating on the chalkboard. At 10 years old, Walt and his family moved to Kansas City, where his uncle employed him to sell snacks and newspapers along the railroad. Being amongst trains all summer induced Walt with a fascination for trains, a passion which can still be seen in his theme parks today. During the rest of the year, Walt would wake up at 4.30 a.m. every morning with his brother Roy to deliver the newspaper before school. They would make another paper round after school as well. The job was exhausting, and Walt would often fall asleep in class. But he continued his paper route for more than six years to help his family. And then, Walt Disney attended McKinley High School back in Chicago, where he drew patriotic pictures about World War I for the school newspaper. At night, He took illustration courses at the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts to broaden his skills. And at 16, a shy yet determined Walt Disney dropped out of high school and attempted to join the army in their fight against the Germans. But he was rejected since he was still under the minimum age of 17. Nevertheless, Walt was insistent on joining, and so he tried again, 
this time enlisting for the Red Cross with a forged birth certificate. And he was accepted and soon was shipped to France, where he spent the following year driving an ambulance. For all the blood and grisly injuries Walt would face on a daily basis, he found comfort in dreaming up a new cartoon character for his future career as an artist. In his downtime, Walt would give life to his unrelenting imagination by drawing on the side of his ambulance, covering it with cartoons from stern to stern. Some of his work was even published in the Army newspaper. After his time in the Army had ended, Walt Disney returned to Kansas City at 18 years old with the goal of becoming a newspaper artist. His brother, Roy, got him a job at the Pesman Rubin Art Studio, and that's where he met Ub Iwerks, a fellow cartoonist there. Not even a year had passed when a sharp decline in revenue, though, pushed Walt Disney out of that job. The justification being that Walt lacked imagination. Now, this would have discouraged many aspiring artists, but not Walt Disney. With unwavering optimism and the support of his new friend, Ub, Walt opened his very first business. Together, they formed iWorks, Disney commercial artists. Sadly, they failed to attract enough customers and the business went under after only a month. Walt was dismayed, but far from being ready to quit on his dream. Walt Disney would write later about his failed business. He said this, quote, All of my obstacles have strengthened me. You may not realize it when it happens, but a kick in the teeth may be the best thing in the world for you. End quote. That was Walt Disney. As determined as Walt Disney was to achieve his goals, No amount of belief was going to get him anywhere without the money to fund it. So he got a job at the Kansas City Film and Ad Company, where he produced short films using cutout animation. Meanwhile at home, Walt began to experiment with a different animation technique using a borrowed camera and book. Later on, he tried to convince the ad agency to adopt his new technique. But they said no. Walt Disney soon decided it was time to quit talking and start doing, so he left that ad agency and opened his second business. And so Walt, Ub, and a handful of animators would work long hours to produce short cartoons called Laughograms. And these seven-minute animations of modernized fairy tales were shown at the local theater, attracting enough attention and popularity to keep their business afloat. And although funding soon began to decline, which pushed Walt Disney to work on the story of a live-action girl called Alice, exploring an animated wonderland. Before he could finish it, his company went bankrupt. And Walt was, once again, left with close to nothing. At 22 years old, and already with two failed business ventures under his belt, Walt Disney felt the only way he could succeed is if he believed in his dream implicitly and unquestionably. He then packed his suitcase, never leaving behind his favorite canned chili, and made the trip to Hollywood. And a whole new chapter of his life was about to begin. Walt met up with his brother Roy, who had just overcome tuberculosis. They pooled their money to set up shop in their uncle's garage in Hollywood. There, Walt dogged studios day after day in an effort to sell his Allison Cartoonland series. He was rejected time and time again, until he heard from Margaret J. Winkler a New York cartoon distributor looking for fresh series. Walt and Roy were equally ecstatic and moved their operation to a rented room at the back of a real estate office. Walt took charge of animation while Roy operated a second-hand camera. They then hired two girls to ink and paint the celluloids. The rental was small, 
and they lacked employees. But the front door proudly read, Disney Brothers Studio. And that's all the incentive Walt needed. Walt Disney's series on Alice was well-received, which allowed the studio to hire more animators. His first hires included his friend Ub Iwerks, and an inker who Walt would later marry. Their studio went on to create more animated shorts and later gave life to a chipper, venturesome character called Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Things were going seemingly well for the studio. Although five years later, Walt attempted to negotiate a higher fee for the Oswald series, only to find the distributor actually wanted to reduce their fee. It turned out that Winkler and her husband had poached Walt's best employees and made them their own. He also discovered that they had stolen the rights to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. He was now faced with the ultimatum of accepting a reduced fee for his work or leaving the studio. Walt chose to leave, along with his loyal animator, Ub. Now at 27 years old, a disillusioned Walt Disney stared blankly out the window while on a train to Hollywood. Disaster seemed right around the corner for his company. But an idea was forming in his restless mind. Walt dug around for his notepad and fervently sketched his idea on paper. The result was Mortimer the Mouse, later baptized as Mickey Mouse by Walt's wife. Well, this character was special. He was more human, adventurous, and hugely optimistic, much like Walt Disney himself. He rushed his rather bad sketch over to Oob, who refined Mickey's appearance while Walt worked on defining his character. Walt's team was on board with this new cartoon, but the question was, would the audience like him as well? Well, Mickey Mouse first appear in Plain Crazy and the Gallopin' Gaucho, two silent films which failed to find distribution. But Walt was used to failure by now and knew better than to roll over. He and his team decided to integrate synchronized sound into a third short called Steamboat Willie. With Oob in charge of animation and Walt lending his own voice as Mickey's, the first ever sound cartoon hit the New York Colon Theater in 1928. It became an instant sensation. The reviews were beyond glowing, and the plans of Mickey merchandise began to bloom. Well, soon enough, film studios began to line up with all sorts of deals for Walt. From experience, he never sold the rights to his prized Mickey. Not this time. And along with his passionate team, Walt formed Disney Studios and went on to create a series of sound cartoons. Gradually, their humorous animations and lovable characters flickered across screens all over the country. Six years, though, and many successful animations later, Walt Disney continued to push the limits of animation by announcing his first full-length feature film. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Everyone thought it was a terrible idea. His wife and brother tried to talk him out of it. But Walt took out multiple bank loans and spent the next three years producing his vision. His very own team thought the film would ruin Disney Studios. Yet Walt Disney persevered. And in 1937, the film became the most successful motion picture of the year. It won dozens of awards and turned enough profit to pay off every bank loan and then some. For years onward then, Disney Studios completed a string of popular animated films and introduced countless iconic characters. But Walt was a well-known workaholic dreamer, and his mind was brimming with even more ambitious ideas. It was one particular Saturday when he was with his daughters. Walt sat on a park bench eating peanuts while his girls played on the merry-go-round. 
Walt remarked on how the traveling fairs and amusement parks of the day were seedy, dirty, and not the kind of places that you would really want to bring your family. As he watched his daughters on the merry-go-round, he began to daydream of a place where parents and children could have fun together. He thought of Tivoli Gardens in Europe, a fantastically designed and clean amusement park. And his plans for a theme park began to hatch. It would be unlike any other, where people of all ages could explore and revel in fantastical experiences. And during this time, Disney explored live-action films as well, with a huge necessary mention from yours truly being 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, a truly groundbreaking film. And if you haven't seen it yet, stream it tonight. You'll be glad you did. And remember, this was made in 1953. The production is amazing. But Walt Disney had his primary sights on creating the perfect experiential dreamland for boys and girls, children of all ages. The perfectly designed land of both fantasy and reality, of adventure and historic boldness, of future endeavors and human progress. And Disneyland opened in 1955. And Walt Disney declared at Disneyland's opening, quote, To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Disneyland is your land. Here, age relives fond memories of the past. And here, youth may savor the challenge and promise of the future. Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. End quote. That was Walt Disney. And Disneyland quickly became the primary destination for families all over the world. And as usual, Walter Elias Disney started focusing his sights on his next big dream. The experimental prototype community of tomorrow, Epcot. And of this dream of Epcot, Walt would say, quote, Epcot will take its cue from the new ideas and new technologies that are now emerging from the creative centers of American industry. It will be a community of tomorrow that will never be completed, but will always be introducing and testing and demonstrating new materials and systems. And Epcot will always be a showcase to the world for the ingenuity and imagination of American free enterprise. End quote. That was Walt Disney describing the genesis of Epcot. And this was all to be a part of Walt's newly conceived Florida project in the orange groves and swamps near a little town called Orlando in Florida. But the years of smoking and not taking care of himself caught up with Walt. And at age 66, Walter Elias Disney passed away. And while his brother Roy continued the Florida project, Epcot was put on the far back burner. And in 1971, Walt Disney World opened with the Contemporary Resort Hotel and the Polynesian Resort at the Gateway. Disney Studios continued to put out movies through this period, but nothing really took off. And then, the plans for Epcot began. And while it wasn't really what Walt had envisioned, it was at least a small part of his dream. And a young boy in Dunedin, Florida, 
counted down the days. And that would be me. And on October 1st, 1981, Epcot opened, with the World Showcase and the pavilions for the future of the world of tomorrow. And for me, although I love the Magic Kingdom, Epcot was my new 10-year-old boy's obsession. Well, this and Star Wars, of course. And as a young man in high school, my high school would qualify every year to sing in Disney's Candlelight Processional. And the Candlelight Processional was a reading through of the Gospel's infancy narrative, with full orchestra, famous narrators, all set around the train station in Main Street, USA. It was glorious. It was a taste of what was behind the magic of Walt Disney World. And all of us kids would always receive tickets from Disney World to return in the future for free. And return we did. As the years went on, Disney started producing some excellent movies that nearly everyone enjoyed from The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, and many others. I would also return to the Magic Kingdom for the Night of Joy, a a night for Christian music and young people. Those were really good days. And Walt Disney World grew and grew, adding resort after resort, adding additional water theme parks, and adding new magic kingdoms in France, Tokyo, and Hong Kong. Disney, the corporation, was exploding. And with Disney MGM Studios and the Animal Kingdom being built, Disney, the corporation, was becoming something that maybe, just maybe, wasn't quite what Walt's vision was of the happiest place on earth. And as we advance into part two, of the deconstruction of Walt Elias Disney's vision of Disney World and of Disney itself. You could probably best understand what has happened over the past 17 years under the leadership of Bob Iger and Bob Chapek by understanding that they have completely disrupted and dismantled Walt Disney's mission statement for Disneyland. And so instead of Walt's original proclamation in 1955, the new Disney proclamation of Disney World and Disneyland could go something like this. To all who come to this woke refuge for deconstruction of the previous hegemony, come, do justice. Disneyland is no longer the land of patriarchy, Judeo-Christian values, and traditional values. Here, ages past and old traditions will be problematized. And here, youth will call for a cultural revolution. Disneyland is now dedicated to the neo-Marxist ideologies of the World Economic Forum and believes that the dreams and the subjective fertile fallacies of the revolution will reshape what was America with the hope that it will be a source of equity and societal reformation to all the world. End quote. And we will pick it up here on episode two of Deconstructing Disney, coming soon. I'm Michael O'Fallon, and this has been Public Occurrences, Both Foreign and Domestic. (laughs) 